Hello everyone, and welcome to Ultimate Fanfiction, so we are back with an interesting series on what if Naruto had three special weapons and awakens Hell Sharingan. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. The mist was thick, the air was still, and the only thing that moved was the wild life that roamed in their domains. A small lizard harmlessly devoured a beetle until it was caught by a large bird that carried it into a tree. That was how life worked. A cruel fate that only rewarded the powerful and crushed the weak. In a river a body slowly floated in the rough waters beneath, carrying it to a destination that it knew nothing of nor held any control over. Normally in this river you would not expect such things as a trail of blood followed the corpse. The body belonged to that of a young man with shaggy blonde hair and a bright kill me orange jumpsuit that had a giant hole in his chest. Another peculiar thing about the young was the eye patch over his left eye, and a strange headband with the symbol of a leaf on his forehead that said that there was more to this kid than what meets the dot eye. Meets the eye? Damn it. Dot cut. A voice called out as the scene paused suddenly and a small portal appeared. Maximum effort. A voice said as out stepped a guy in a red suit and mask reading the Naruto manga volume 4 until he looked up at the audience and as he dropped the book while kicking it away. The white eyes on his face mask change, making him look joyous as he waved at the audience. Oh, hello there. You may be wondering, why the red suit, it's so that bad guys can't see me bleed and good gals can't tell that I played with myself. He then looked directly at the audience. By the way, I'm touching myself tonight. He then looked at the dead body and placed both his hands over his face with a loud gasp. Ooh that doesn't look good, he said before looking back at the audience, I hate to break it to you but that kid is supposed to be the hero of this story. Yet he is very dead right now, he said before he suddenly giving a thumbs up. But don't worry we have his entire backstory to tell, and have absolutely no plans to talk about his future. No plans at all. Think of it as my way of giving you a happy meal except I'm not crazy clown prince of crime trying to supersize you. He said as he paused as a smaller version of himself appeared on his shoulders with a piece of paper in his hand. The smaller version handed it to him, quickly read over it before rolling it into a ball and tossing it over his shoulders. A small explosion followed soon after with the scene turning into a news desk, and the red guy was now in a business suit with the same red mask but with a terrible black toupee on his head. The words breaking news appeared in big bold letters over his right shoulder, showing a picture of a chalk outline, typically found at a murder scene with the phrase, a not so cad avorific voyage, ladies and gentlemen breaking news. The dead kid's name is Naruto Uzumaki and we have exclusive footage of his last day alive. Let's go to the tape, he said as he raised a remote with his thumb hovering over a button. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. This story was brought to you by, The Vejuvenator. Rejuvenate your vagina and make him think it's your first time. This was also brought to you by Joe the Wingman. Just give him a call and he will fuck the fat one. The red suited guy said as he tossed the piece of paper behind his back which only revealed a naked hentai chick playing with herself. He then brought back up the remote and pressed the button to make the screen beside him turn on. Flashback. The man in the red suit was currently sitting on a random couch with his right hand looking like it should belong to his infant self. I bet it will feel huge in this hand. Which was all that was said as the screen stopped with the message, please stand by. Real flashback. Naruto. The voice of Kakashi rang out through the silence accompanied. Naruto stood still. A stunned expression plastered on his whiskered face as he looked down at his chest and saw his sensei's hand protruding through it. The mon's eyes wide as saucers as his Sharingan recorded the image of him killing his student was permanently etched into his memory. Naruto then looked to the left side of the bridge and took notice of Haku laying in her spot with only a look of shock at what just occurred. He was able to stop her from saving her master but in the process he would take the strike himself. He was dying for her now none of this was making sense to any of them, including Zabuza, Kabikirabocho firmly gripped in one hand, his body restrained by several of Kakashi's dog summons after he set up an ambush that left the demon of the mist at his mercy. But as he was prepared to become the latest victim to Kakashi's most famous jutsu, two blurs changed the scenario drastically and now he stood with Naruto dying. Naruto coughed up a large glob of blood that spilled onto the ground as he took hold of his sensei's arm and removed it, causing the bleeding to intensify, and soak the entire front of his jacket. 
his body growing woozy from the blood loss as he looked his sensei in the eye with a painful smile until his body fell face first onto the floor. A large pool instantly formed as the hounds released their hold and vanished back to the summon realm. Zabuza instantly felt the pressure release from his body. His left arm useless for the moment due to the giant bulldog biting into his shoulder. The blood flowed freely from the bite sized wounds, though it would be for naught. He felt no pain. His body was numb from staring at the body of the young Genin that sacrificed his life for two enemies he didn't even know. He could honestly say that he had never seen anything like it in his long bloody career. Naruto. Haku was the first to actually react, she rushed over to his prone body and flipped it over. The young woman placed both hands over his wounded chest and began compression along with giving mouth to mouth in panic. It was a desperate panic as she worked twice as hard to only get the same results. Naruto being both unresponsive and cold, a sight Kakashi had seen one too many times in his life. Blood coating her hands, tears freely fell from her eyes. I'm sorry Naruto, I take it all back. Please, I take it all back. She wept into her hands until she laid her head on the dead blonde's shoulder. Please don't go, she said but was only met with silence. Kakashi took a deep breath when he heard the voice of Sakura break through the silence with the same tone as the young lady near him. He would have endured the lose of two students at nearly the same time, both forever showing his failure as a teacher. He watched his teammate die and was forced to kill his other within a matter of months. He felt a cold darkness surround his vision as only Naruto's body remained. Snap out of it Hitaki you are in the middle of a battle. Zabuza growled, knowing that Kakashi could not fight in the proper state of mind. Their battle to the death was supposed to be the both of them giving it their all, he wanted to kill Kakashi at his best, his pride demanded it. He moved Kabikirabocho just a fraction, and saw Senban needles embedded near his foot. He locked onto an icy stare with Haku, the young ice user's expression telling him that she would not allow him to move. There has been enough bloodshed, she whispered. We are enemy shinobi for hire, this is the risk we took, that kid knew it too. Zabuza said he giant blade moving with his good arm. There will be no more bloodshed, she said through tears that turned to frost as the area grew somewhat colder. This fight must have a winner and the loser must be dead, he continued pointing his signature weapon at Kakashi. The Sharingan warrior on the other hand paid no mind to his enemy. All he could do was stare at his right appendage. Naruto. He whispered to himself, his student's blood dripping from his hand. Damn it Hitaki. Snap out of it, Zabuza roared, changing his pose to charge forward until Haku appeared in front of him. Her foot stomped into a puddle of water, her right hand flashing through a set of one-handed seals. Secret Jutsu. A thousand needles of death, she called out. The needles penetrated the concrete of the bridge, separating both her and Zabuza. Haku, what are you doing? Zabuza demanded. His head was spinning his body feeling the exhaustion from the intense battle, and now he was feeling how bad his wounds were. I said there has been enough bloodshed, Haku screamed, her tone practically demanded Zabuza to stand down. He tried to step forward again until he looked at the young woman he raised and saw only sadness in her eyes. Please, no more. Zabuza just stood there watching the child he raised into the ultimate weapon stop him from his quest to eliminate that masked shinobi legend but his body was already spent from such a strenuous fight and to add a new threat in his ally would not work well for him. God fucking damn it. The demon of the mist said as his shoulders relaxed and allowed his body to rest. You're still too soft. Zabuza always knew this. Haku, she never liked to fight, to harm people. He made her his weapon to be used and disposed of by him. But no matter how hard he trained her, he could not kill her heart. She was still a human being. She could still feel guilt and sadness, happiness and joy. In the end, not even he could keep his heart hard enough to feel nothing. Feeling his body no longer full of adrenaline, the demon of the mist gave up. He could not bring himself to fight against Haku. Thank you, she said, her body relaxing until they all heard the sound of clapping echoing throughout the heavy mist. At the end of the bridge they could see Gato and his hired mercenaries all gathered in a group, weapons drawn for battle. Zabuza what the hell am I paying you for if you can't even kill a bunch of brats? He demanded until he noticed Naruto's body lying on the ground. Hey, it seems you got at least one. But still, it doesn't make much sense to keep paying when I have these guys. They can do it cheaper and bloodier. 
he said as he went through a lot of trouble to hire these men from the depths of the black market. It seems my boss just fired me, Zabuza said in a haggard tone. You're damn right I just fired you, baby demon, Gatto said as he reached into his suit pocket and revealed a device no bigger than a deck of cards that contained a trigger button. Now please do me the honor of sending you back to hell. He then pushed the button. The results were instantaneous as an explosion rocked the bridge and dislodged giant chunks of concrete, rebar, support beams, railings and building supplies. The shinobi, despite being wounded and exhausted moved hastily to prevent them from falling and being crushed by debris. But for both Kakashi and Haku, they watched as Naruto's body was lost to the water below when his portion of the bridge broke apart. End flashback. And that's that's, our blonde hero died heroically, he said with a valiant tone. Gato on the other hand, he died like a coward, he said with the most upbeat tone ever heard. I mean he died so bad Hans Grubber called him a punk ass bitch in hell, he said as he brandished several photos and grimaced at each one he flipped through. Man, this is even gruesome for me and I once shoved a guy's head up a dead guy's ass. All he could scream was, not the butt, not the butt, of course I would cut his head off and make it a butt plug for a dead guy but hey, who's keeping score? Isn't the murder all that matters? He asked as he shook his masked head. I guess you can say he died hard. A very loud yell of Y E A A A echoed in the background as he placed a pair of black glasses over his eyes with an explosion appearing in the reflection. Tossing the pictures over his shoulder as if they were irrelevant, he then went back to talking to the audience. Okay, now that Naruto is super dead, you would think that that would be the story, but there is a twist and it involves that glory I mean, the eye patch. He said before he brought his right hand to the side of his head. More breaking news, we got footage. A camera cut to Naruto's body when it was caught within the riptide and taken further down the stream and eventually going down a waterfall. The viewers expected him to rupture like a meat balloon as he splattered from such a great height. But as it went down the fall a sudden explosion of red chakra and an inhuman roar echoed loudly throughout whatever place we were. The chakra formed an orb in midair as it turned into a large fox with nine tails swishing behind as it took off along the riverbank beneath its feet. Miles and miles the red chakra fox ran until suddenly the beast stopped and sat on its hind legs. The fox sat for a moment until it let out another roar that caused it to turn white for some odd reason. When the chakra dispersed only the corpse remained with only shreds of clothing that barely covered his decency but his body was miraculously healed as it plummeted back into the body of water below. There was no trace of what happened to it afterwards. Holy shitballs. Oh holy shitballs. The guy swiped his arms across the news desk to show that he wasn't looking at papers, or reading off notes, it was just a bunch of nude pictures of certain anime girls in hentai posses. Okay, whose balls do I have to fondle to see where this is heading? The guy in the red suit said as the camera panned out to reveal that he was, hey, 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 I'm jacking off here. Go to the next scene, you son of a bitch. Time skip. Three days later, the smell of freshly cooked food hit his nose quickly as he could tell by the aroma that it was made with much care and joy. Unfortunately, for the cook, he didn't care. A knock upon his door soon soured his already foul mood. Sasuke kun, come on and eat breakfast. Make sure the big guy comes down with you. The voice of his pink-haired teammate echoed out as the Uchiha clan heir got out of his bed and looked up to see one Zabuza Momochi steering himself awake. Damn it girl. Zabuza gruffly said before sitting up, for once his face unmasked, revealing some very sharp teeth on his scowling face. The former Mist Shinobi looked towards the kid he was forced to bunk with, he didn't need to be some sort of shrink to know that the death of the blonde kid greatly affected him for the last three days. The Uchiha had not spoken a single word, not a single one. He recalled the details of the previous three days. After Gato set off the explosions that resulted in the kid's body falling over, the stakes could not have been higher. The village people the former tycoon terrorized all got together and formed a resistance wall on the other side of the bridge. Kakashi, himself and Haku worked together, and between his brutal ways of using Kubikiribocho, Kakashi showing exactly what he was like in his Anbu days, and the massive water source that Haku had to work with, the mercenary army Gato hired didn't stand a chance. As for Gato himself, Haku surprised him with how she killed the man. It was brutal, even by his standards. After it was all done and over with the Uchiha kid regained consciousness, 
and learned that that the blonde pain in the ass had perished and his body went missing. For as long as he had been a shinobi, he had felt the environment shift around him before, everything could be calm, then filled with bloodlust. This however was filled with loathing depression. The pink-haired girl, Sakura if he recalled her name correctly, was doing her best to be the backbone of the team and Kakashi was holding his own. But Zabuza noticed how that every time Kakashi looked at his right hand it would tremble, and he would look away out of fear. For a man who did a great job hiding his face behind a half mask, he wasn't doing well in hiding his emotions. The Uchiha kid on the other hand was a mess. An emotional wreck of a human being if he had ever seen one. Zabuza figured those two genin were very close friends if he was acting like his world shattered. The door closing shut took him out of his thoughts when Sasuke left the room. Screw it, ain't none of my business. Keeping his hands in his pockets, Sasuke sluggishly marched down the stairway. For the past three days he had just been on autopilot, numb, his mind cloudy and barely able to comprehend what happened. He made it downstairs to be greeted by Haku and Sakura working with Tsunami to make breakfast while Inari set the table. Tazuna was already there drinking a cup of coffee. Inari are you almost done? Tsunami asked as the girls looked over their stations. I'll have this done mom, dad Bayo. Inari exclaimed until he looked up to see Sasuke standing at the entrance of the kitchen. Before the young boy could say anything Sasuke turned on his heel and slammed the front door loudly on his way out. Who knew such a silent, then loud action could have an effect on the four people present. Sakura noticed Haku and felt bad for her. After Gato was dealt with, and an uneasy peace agreement was established, the two girls talked to quite an extent over the last three days and found that while they held virtually nothing in common, they at least got along well. She learned how hard Haku had it growing up and all it did was remind her of everything that Naruto went through growing up as her sensei explained it to her as best as he could. It made her regret a great deal of actions she did when she was young. I never thought that there could be kids like me all over the shinobi nations that lost everything too, Haku quietly said. It's just how things are, we can't control it, Sakura replied before they both walked over to the table and sat down to eat. When is your sensei coming back? Tazuna asked before taking a sip of his coffee. He should be back sometime today. I don't know the details, but he said that there was something that he had to investigate before he left. Sakura said with a slight shrug of her shoulders. Whatever it was, it had to have been important. What about Sasuke? Inari asked. Sakura looked down at her plate, sadness clouding her vision. Sasuke just lost his best friend and rival. I don't think he is going to recover anytime soon. With Sasuke, the last Uchiha of Konohagakure currently stared at the area that both he and Naruto called their training spot when they both competed to master the tree walking exercise. Looking back, it was a lot of fun for him. Not since the bell test had he been challenged in order to understand his abilities as a shinobi. He looked at the two trees the both of them ran up, both having slash marks that went very high to mark their progress. All he could hear was Naruto's voice echo through his mind as he remembered the good times he spent training with his best friend, now that he was gone, all he felt was regret that he didn't admit it sooner, Naruto was an annoying blonde idiot who irked him, but he was his annoying blonde idiot that irked him. A small memorial was built before the tree just yesterday by Team 7 with Sakura giving the tribute. She was the only one who could do it because both him and Kakashi were unable. The both of them had heavy loses in their lives that made it difficult to speak about their latest loss. Sasuke pulled out a kanai knife and with a set of determined eyes he ran up the tree Naruto used. As fast as he could, he ran hard up the bark surface until he landed on the top branch, right where his teammate rested on with a goofy, but satisfied smile. He used the knife to crave out the name, Dobi, on it to give himself a small, ghost of a laugh as he looked out into the distance and watched the sun shine over the horizon. He even activated his Sharingan to burn the scene into his memory. I'm going to miss you Doby, he said, running his hand across his eyes to wipe away the tears forming. Bringing them back to their usual onyx color, he relaxed into a comfortable spot, as much as a tree could provide. His eyes then looked to the side to see Haku appearing on the tree top beside his. Is everything okay? He asked, satisfied ending his three days of silence. I just wanted to keep you company, she said gaining a silent nod before they both looked at the scenery. Minutes passed without them speaking a word. Normally Sasuke wouldn't mind this, but now the silence was killing him. Naruto, 
he always made some sort of commotion to break the silence. I discovered both my parents dead with my brother standing over their corpses. Sasuke said, causing the young woman to perk up. Naruto was by my side the very next day to keep me company and even went as far as to move in with me, he said with a few broken chuckles in between. He didn't even realize he moved in until I noticed all the stuff that belonged to him was in my place, the dobi. He said laughing to himself as he remembered whenever Naruto overreacted to situations. Haku looked at the young boy in surprise. It was only three days ago that they were on opposing sides of the shinobi field and now they were just ordinary people having a conversation. What strange times they lived in. I watched my father kill my mother when I was young and to escape from him and my village I had to kill him in self-defense. Haku began telling Sasuke the story she told Naruto. I spent a long time on the streets, struggling to find any place that would keep me warm at night. A few days I had to go without eating and others I would have to sleep outside in the freezing cold. Zabuza was the first chance I had to ever feel like I had some type of purpose. A small, sad smile formed on her beautiful face. I'm afraid that I allowed that to consume me, she said as she looked towards him. I'm sorry for what I did to you and your friend. We were on separate sides, that is the world of shinobi. Allies can become enemies, and enemies can become allies. Sasuke said, he then began to push the issue away to something else that had been on his mind. What will you do now? You have your freedom to do whatever you want. I am a shinobi, and I will be without a purpose if I stay here. I wish to return with you to your village and join their ranks. Zabuza would likely want to come with me, but I think he should stay here. She said, a small smile forming. He has a lot to atone for here, perhaps when he is done he could join us at an eventual date. If your Hokage allows it of course. HMPH, Konoha won't be a walk in the park in terms of joining. But I think you guys would make fine additions to our ranks. Zabuza would be a challenge, but if they informed the Sandame ahead of time, they could make the transition easier. I want to join your team when we get back there, Haku said, causing the Uchiha to snap his head towards her, surprise plastered on his face. I owe it to your friend to continue his spot since he sacrificed himself for me. Sasuke was silent for the longest time, looking over the view he said. I think he would like that idea. The both of them sat in silence for a long time after that. Meanwhile, with Kakashi, Kakashi, it's been three days. Pakun, the leader of Kakashi's dog summon said. Both him and his summoner were standing at the bottom of the waterfall watching as the water flowed by them without a care in the world. He's somewhere out there Pakun. That burst of chakra, Kakashi had been holding onto some sort of hope that Naruto was still alive, Kayubi's chakra was potent. He remembered it clearly when it attacked Kanahagakur 12 years ago and feeling it on the bridge confirmed that the tailed beast was active. He had to have healed Naruto he just had to. Was more than likely the Kyubi escaping. The pug summon didn't beat around the bush. There were two reasons they were out here instead of healing in Tazuna's home. The first was to actually find proof of Naruto's death, if that was the case they would bring his body back for a proper burial. The second, and as much as Kakashi hated to do it, it was to secure the Kyubi. The nine-tailed fox was a powerful deterrent for the other nations. Iwagakur had two, Kumogakur had two, Karigakur had one with another missing, and their sorta allies Sunagakur and Takigakur had one each. If Naruto was dead, they would need a new Jinchuriki as a new deterrent. But they didn't find a body, not a trace of it. All they found were some shredded rags of Naruto's hideously orange jumpsuit that were currently clutched in Kakashi's shaking right hand. The copycat shinobi looked to the ground, unable to form any words. You did your best Kakashi. I can say for certain you would put a bloodhound to shame. Pakun said before resting on the ground. But Naruto is gone, and the Kayubi is gone, reborn and will reform one day. You need to get back to your students. I don't know how I can face them anymore. My father, Obito, Rin, Sensei, and now Naruto. How can I get past this? By taking it one day at a time, Kakashi. Pakun rested his head on his paws. That's all we can do. The rushing waterfall did nothing to calm Kakashi's thoughts, nor did it help him get over with what he did. Instead he stayed silent, clutching the wet orange cloth in his shaking right hand. 
As Team 7 continued to mourn their loss there was another incident occurring some country hundreds of miles away from Wave Country. Elsewhere. Random House. Naruto cracked his left eye open. He found himself confused, the last thing he remembered was jumping in front of Haku and then, nothing. He couldn't remember how he got here, or where here was, or why he was missing his clothes. Honestly, he should have wondered where his clothes were first, then figured out where he was. Taking in his surroundings, Naruto saw he was in a remarkably spartan bedroom, the door was on the other side of the room, the bed was small, it could fit only one person, perhaps two if they lied on top of each other. He noticed a dress that was well used, but well cared for. The lights were off, he noticed the overhead lights, okay so the place had electricity and he didn't wind up in some sort of backwoods cannibal hillbilly homestead. The first thing Naruto tried to do was sit up, but found that his body wouldn't respond to his demands. The fox was silent, granted he was always silent, the furry bitch never said a word to him. After trying several times, and only succeeding in tiring himself out, the blonde gave up. His body needed rest, it was the only way he could get out of the room. The door opened with a creak, the exhausted blonde lost the element of surprise by pretending to be asleep. But he did get a look at exactly who might have brought him to this place. It turned out to be a girl about his age. She was petite, tan-skinned, wore an orange clip in her short, layered mint green hair that matched her eye color, orange. Her outfit consisted of a short sleeveless white midriff shirt with fishnet armor underneath, long white armlets, and fishnet shorts with a short white apron skirt over it. She also also carried a cylindrical object in red wrapping on her back. Oh, you're awake, good to see you lucky boy. The girl greeted him in a cheerful manner. She was immediately by his side, looking him over. I found you a few days ago floating in the river, you looked bad, honestly what happened, did you get mauled by a bear? But then again, I don't see any marks showing it. She said checking over his body and making him blush a few times whenever her hands got too close. Wow, she was really chatty and energetic. Where am I? Waterfall country, lucky boy. She said as her eyes became serious with Naruto at her mercy she began to interrogate him by lifting up his tattered leaf headband. What is a shinobi from Kanahagakur doing in my country? Huh, answer me, she said with her weapon pointed at his face, do have you any allies nearby? She asked with Naruto raising his hands defensively. I don't even know how I got here. All I remember was that I was on a mission and, he said as the memories suddenly rushed to his head and it lead to him clutching his chest but found only his heartbeat. But he was stunned as his hand felt the newly formed scar on his chest which made him look down in shock, how did I survive that? He asked in complete disbelief. This caused Fu to remove her weapon as she grasped his face so that he would look at her, are you okay lucky boy? She asked with Naruto looking her in the eye with his one lone eye piercing her gaze while the other was covered by an eye patch what's with the eye patch? She asked not removing her hands though. I lost an eye and a friend but the bastard that took them died a slow death. Naruto said as his mind went back to the day that changed his life. Flashback. Hiyashi Hayuga raced through the halls of his home as fast as he could with the alarm system blaring but he did not listen. His daughter was in danger and he was going to protect her. He ran and ran until he reached an entry point on the side with a sight that would be etched in stone in his memory. The only sound that could be heard was weeping as his daughter slowly rocked a young blonde boy back and forth telling him that it was okay. On the ground laid two bodies, both male with one dead and the other dying. The first male was a Hyuga that had a pool of blood around his body with a single stab wound in his back. His face was in his direction with his forehead fear of the caged bird seal thus telling him that he was a member of the main house member. His young cousin, Hoado Hayuga lied there dying. The other male was dead as a doorknob with animalistic wounds accompanying a horrified expression permanently etched onto his face. But what really drew his eye was the image that was on his headband that told him that this guy was from cloud country. His eyes then went towards the young man that was crying in his daughter arms with a huge wound over his left eye. Missing left eye that is. The regal figure then approached the young pair to bend down on one knee, getting the attention of his young daughter as he placed a hand on the one-eyed blonde's shoulders. Young man, please tell me the name of the person that saved my daughter's life. He asked with the blonde turning to him to show his lone blue eye. 
Naruto Uzwamki Sir, Dadbeo. Today was a day of celebration that took many long years of war to achieve. An era of peace between Kanahagakur and Kumogakur was officially made by the Hokage and the Rakage in Iron Country. Both sides had been stuck in gridlock for a long time and peace seemed like a foregone conclusion. But the efforts of the Hokage persisted and was able to bring Kumo to an agreement. Although many lives were lost between the two sides, one infamously being the death of the Nadaime Hokage in the First Great Shinobi War and the efforts of the Yandaime Hokage in the Third Great Shinobi War that turned the tide in their favor. All in all though, both sides had each other's blood on their hands. They felt it was time to clean it off. The streets were full of harmonious joy and laughter from the many children playing random games or talking to their parents to the parade that filled the streets. Amongst the audience was the Sandame Hokage standing with a three-year-old blonde-haired boy in his arms. The young boy had bright blue eyes and whisker-like marks on his cheeks that were only filled with wonder as he witnessed all the festivities. Are you having fun Naruto-kun? Hiruzen Serutobi, the Sandame Hokage of Konoha, said to the young boy named Naruto. Yeah old man, this parade is awesome Dadbeo. He exclaimed with a bright smile on his face as he looked at the patrons walking the street. Though his eyes laid on one man and for some reason, the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. He was a tall, slim man with dark eyes with lines underneath them, black hair and goatee. He wore a dark grey kumo flak jacket which had thick shoulder pads. His head was bandaged and a kumogaker forehead protector covered his right eye. Naruto kept his eyes on the cloud shinobi for a long time. When the man locked his lone eye with his, he smiled, but it didn't reach his eye. Old man who was that guy? Naruto asked, causing Hiruzen to look in the direction of the cloud shinobi. That man is the head ninja of Kumogakur, he is here to deliver the peace treaty we agreed to sign. The elderly man said with the young boy not taking his eyes off him. I'm getting a weird vibe from him. Naruto said, causing the elderly man to chuckle. The child was only three years old and had never seen a person from another village before, it wasn't that uncommon for someone so young to have a small amount of mistrust towards strangers. Hiruzen put it out of his mind for now. With this treaty soon to be in effect there would be one less enemy to worry about, it would ease his tired old bones and allow his people to rest easier at night. That was his hope at least. Later that night, the Hyuga compound. Ah, that festival was pretty cool. Naruto sighed out in enjoyment as he rubbed his full stomach. And who could honestly blame the young blonde? The people were in high spirits, there was good food and games. The Hokage actually spent most of the day with him playing various games and enjoying the festivities. And most importantly the villagers barely gave him a second look when he walked the streets. No glares, no mutterings of him being a demon brat, honestly Naruto could get used to that. The day would have been perfect if it wasn't from the odd feeling he got from that head ninja guy. Something about him just screamed that he was dangerous, up to no good, and just generally a very bad guy. But the old man told him not to worry about it, he was just the first shinobi he had ever seen from outside the village, and he was just nervous. Now perhaps he was right, but Naruto could not shake the feeling from the guy. Not even Ichiraku ramen could drown that feeling of his, and it didn't take much of their ramen to settle him down. Ugh, stop being silly Naruto. He chided himself with a small laugh. It's nothing to worry about. A peace treaty is supposed to be a good thing, if the village is safe then it should be good enough for me. After all, I'm going to have to do the same thing when I become Hokage, Dadbeo. He said in excitement as he began to daydream about the day he would wear the Hokage's hat. That excitement soon died when he felt a terrible feeling within the village. His blue eyes widened in alarm as it got worse, much worse from that morning. It was nearing eleven at night, what could be going on? Before he knew it the whiskered face blonde was running towards the area where he had that terrible feeling. This is stupid even for you, you're three years old what sort of help can you even give? He mentally shouted at himself, what he was doing was beyond stupid, dangerous even. So why was he running in the direction of danger? Because he knew that was what the Hokage would do, he would run into the fires of hell for anyone, and if he wanted to be Hokage, a hero, he could not run from anyone. He arrived in the area where whatever was causing his senses to go haywire. He ran at full speed and found himself out of breath, 
Honestly running five minutes straight on a full stomach was not the smartest idea he had. But he couldn't find anything, was he wrong? No he couldn't have been wrong, his body was on high alert now. Feeling that it would be a good idea to get a higher vantage point the young blonde began to scramble up a wooden fence. Once he managed to pop his spiky blonde head over it he found himself struck off the fence by a larger body. Ow, he screamed out in pain as he fell off the fence and fell onto the unforgiving ground. Whatever hit him also fell to the ground with a loud thud. Scrambling to his feet he saw that it was a large man wearing a black suit of clothing and an obi around his waist, completed by a black mask that completely covered his face. Now if that didn't scream, I'm a bad guy, then he didn't know what did. Ah, what the, the figure looked to see some spiky blonde haired, blue eyed kid wearing an orange shirt, white shorts and blue sandals. The only remarkable thing about him were three whisker marks on each of his cheeks. I got knocked over by a brat. I'm not going to report that back home. Hey, who are you? Naruto loudly demanded as he pointed at the figure. He then looked at a black cloth sack that was moving, now a bunch of red flags were ringing in his head. And what's with that moving sack? Be quiet boy, this is private business. The stranger blasted him with a small amount of killing intent that made him freeze up. Inwardly the man cursed, he wanted to make this quick and clean, but now he needed to leave a body behind. He couldn't afford to leave a single witness. Oh well, what was one brat in the larger picture of things? Naruto honestly couldn't move an inch, he literally fought for every single gasp of air. Who was this guy, some sort of monster? He watched as the man reached into a kunai pouch strapped to his right leg and withdrew the black steel kunai knife. He threw back his right arm to throw it, and the blonde saw his very short life flash in front of his terrified eyes. But then he saw a man in a cream robe attack the figure. He was roughly 19 years old, possessed featureless white eyes with distinct pupils and veins bulging near his temples. His brown hair that was styled into a top knot flowed like water as he struck the attacker with his palm in the side. The stranger in black seemed to have grimaced at the hit, but to the shock of the blonde, and horrid realization of the pale-eyed man the person he hit with a palm strike erupted in a small cloud of smoke and in his place was a broken wooden bucket. Then, to Naruto's horror he watched as the man appeared behind the pale-eyed man, his lone eye gleaming with murderous intent before a ball of light blue lightning formed in his right hand. Lightning ball, the figure growled, slamming the jutsu into his opponent's back. The teenager who was meant to save them, Naruto watched as his pale eyes bulged out in agony. His joints locked up and he bit down on his tongue with such force that he severed it. But even with all the pain and agony he went through, he turned on his heel and struck the man in black in the temple, it caused him to lose focus for just enough time for him to jerk the bag away from him and threw it towards Naruto himself. Rum boy, he spat out, blood flying from his mouth as he turned to face his opponent. Naruto caught the sack and turned to run with all the strength his small legs could give him. His mind was racing a mile a minute, everything was wrong. His young mind couldn't process the violence he just witnessed. What was so important in this sack? As he ran down the street the blonde youth fiddled with the string holding the bag closed and what was revealed to him stopped his blood cold. It was a girl about his age, her complexion was fair, dark blue hair that was styled in a heim cut, but most importantly she had the same featureless pale eyes of the man who was fighting off that terrible man. He looked into her eyes and saw that they had some lavender around the edges and saw the terrified tears running down her cheeks. Don't worry you're going to be okay. Naruto forced a smile on his face as he continued to run. That bad man isn't going to lay his hands on you again, I promise. As if karma came to bite him in the ass, Naruto saw the man in black appear before him and he felt a savage kick in his stomach. He felt his body flying through the air and impacted the ground harshly. He lost the girl in the process, her small body tumbling out of the bag to reveal a cream-colored sleeping kimono. The kidnapper growled looking at the mess of it all. This little brat nearly ruined everything. He had to not only use a jutsu to paralyze that pesky Hyuga, but also stab him in the back to be rid of him. No more you little brat. He hissed at the blonde troublemaker. Clutching the bloody kunai knife he threw it at the boy, he had done this multiple times during his shinobi career, it was how he survived the third great shinobi war. He watched as it sailed through the air and he waited for it to pierce through the brat's head. Naruto, 
for all his years he had been alive, couldn't believe the amount of pain he was in. Sure, he got into fights with some other kids before, the emotional pain of being ignored hurt a lot, but he was never hurt like this before. Gritting his teeth he slowly stood to his feet and glared defiantly at the kidnapper. He made a promise to the girl that he wouldn't lay his hands on her again, and he always kept his promises. So when he threw his weapon the young blonde lifted his left hand and caught it. The sharp tip pierced through the palm of his hand, and the kanai was driven through his left eye. Hot white pain tore through his body, it hurt so much that his mind temporarily shut down to spare him from the agony. No, the young Hyuga screamed, tears nearly blinding her. Please. Dot get up, please don't die. It's no use girl, he's dead. The kidnapper growled. His sandaled feet echoed like thunder as he stepped towards her, an evil grin forming under his masked face. But then he felt it, foul, malicious chakra that stopped him in his tracks. He turned to see the boy he thought he killed rising up to his feet. His body was surrounded by a layer of red, wispy chakra. His canines were longer, his fingernails turned into claws, the whisker marks on his cheeks grew darker. And to his horror the kidnapper watched as Naruto raised his right hand and pulled the kunai out of his hand with a spurt of blood. His blood then froze in complete, pants shitting terror as the boy's remaining blue eye turned into a crimson slitted eye. He looks just like, no he can't be. Naruto let out a feral roar that destroyed nearby windows, damaged tiles off the roofs, and more than likely made anyone nearby need a change of pants. The blonde rushed at the kidnapper and swiped his hands at him. The man raised his arms to protect his vitals, getting deep gouges in his arms, but it wasn't anything life-threatening. He threw a punch at him, but the young boy dipped under the arm and sliced through his chest. The man growled in anger and he went through several hand seals to unleash a lightning jutsu that would fry the brat. But it was not to be, the chakra flowing through Naruto made him faster and stronger. He closed the distance between them, and swiped his right claw at the kidnapper. Blood erupted from four clean claw marks in his neck, blood erupted from his mouth and stained his mask. He backpedaled, gaze growing dark and finally he collapsed onto the ground as his life blood drained from his body. Seeing the threat eliminated, the chakra receded and Naruto felt the pain all at once. The loss of his eye, the wound in his hand, his ribs hurting, and the shock that he killed someone. He began to hyperventilate and go into shock. Who could blame him? No three-year-old was mentally prepared for something like that. He then felt a pair of arms wrap around him, blood from his wound began to stain her sleeping kimono but the girl in front of him didn't care. She gave him a smile that practically said everything was going to be okay, and somehow he believed it. Naruto broke down against her, becoming drained in every sense of the word, at least until he felt a hand on his shoulder. Young man, please tell me the name of the person who saved my daughter. S life. He looked at the girl in concern, and then back at him. Naruto Uzumaki, Sir Dadbeo. Naruto quietly introduced himself before blissfully losing consciousness. Time skip. A few hours later, Naruto was lying asleep in his bed with a bandage wrapped over his left eye and a cast around his left arm and hand. The blonde boy rested comfortably for someone that just lost an eye, but he was just grateful to be alive. A couple other people in particular were happy that he was alive as well. Outside the boys' room stood Hiyashi Hayuga and the Sandame Hokage, Hiruzen Serutobi, looking over the medical charts that gave in detail what his injuries were. A cracked rib cage, almost fully healed. Broken left hand with stab wound, bones in cast. Single stab wound to the left eye, irreparable damage, permanent blindness. This is a real problem Hiyashi. Hiruzen said after just getting news that the head ninja held other motives beyond a peace treaty. He was exhausted from his political nightmare. Because of him my young cousin will now have to be laid to rest. Hiyashi said several seconds later. On the outside he was calm and composed, but inwardly he was far from it. His daughter was kidnapped, and a member of his family was lying on death's door. And it all happened right under his nose, he never felt more powerless in his entire life. I know what it is like to lose someone Hiyashi, Hiruzen said. In his long life he lost both his mother and father, and three years ago he lost his wife of thirty years. He knew exactly what the Hyuga clan head was going through. But we need to mourn later, 
I need to know how did Naruto end up with all these injuries on your property. I do not know how he got there, what I do know is that I felt a spike of the Kyubi's chakra and that he saved my daughter. As far as I am concerned, he's a hero to my family. Hiyashi firmly said, causing the elderly cage to visibly relax. For so long the boy had been seen as a demon by the villagers, with this he was one step closer to being seen as the hero the Yandaimi wanted him to be seen as. Before I left Hoato to leave him to pass peacefully with his parents next to him, he made a request. He wrote down that he wants the boy to have his eye to replace his old one. Hiyashi dropped the biggest bombshell on the Hokage's head. The entire room was silent, you could even hear a pin drop from it. So when Hiruzen slowly turned his neck towards the Hyuga clan head the joints in his neck popped. You would allow an outsider to hold your family's special dujutsu. I am giving the hero of my daughter a gift only I can allow. Hiyashi calmly replied, he didn't show it, but there was an air of smug satisfaction on his face. Would the elders not protest this? Hiruzen asked, it wouldn't be the first time he had to deal with them regarding their purity views, they absolutely refused outsiders to study their keke genke, let alone have one of their eyes removed to put in the eye socket of another like Obito did with Kakashi. The fact they fought him at every turn to have Jiraiya modify their seal caused him no end of headaches. They seem to forget that I am the clan head, and what I do regarding clan matters is up to me, not them. Hiyashi replied, for too long they had been undermining his every move to change the clan. For too long his clan had been divided all because someone was born second. After tonight they would not undermine him ever again. The surgery is going to be extensive, unlike Kakashi, Naruto is going to need the blood vessels around his new eye to be slightly modified in order to increase the blood flow. Hiruzen wasn't known as the professor for nothing, for as long as he had been alive he picked up a thing or ten revolving around the clans that lived within his village, things that were public knowledge and things that weren't exactly on record. I will personally oversee the operation, Hokage-sama. Hiyashi firmly said to the Sandame Hokage. As the head of the Hyuga clan I know the workings of our dojutsu better than anyone else. I'll make sure that it's connected properly. It takes a lot more than just connecting the eye to blood vessels, Naruto is going to need to be taught how to use it. Hiruzen looked to the man next to him. I assume you're going to take responsibility. Hazashi will train the boy. Hiyashi said referring to his younger twin brother. He is the strongest within the branch family, Naruto will flourish under him along with my nephew. That might ruffle a few feathers within the main family, Hiruzen commented. Inwardly Hiyashi was cackling at the thought of their faces when he told them his plans. That is the point. Naruto's bedroom, I'm at the hospital again. The old man must be on the other side. He said lightly to himself as he felt the irritation around his now empty left eye socket. He didn't feel any stitches near his wound so that was good, but he now knew that his eye was gone. His mind flashed through his memories of the moment again and again. He was locked out of the orphanage for that night and was just trying to find a quiet spot to camp out. Normally he would not risk camping out on the Hyuga grounds but he figured given the festival that enough of them would be too tired to care. Then he saw that man carrying that young girl in a bundle sack. He saw her kicking the bag to try to break out. What he did was remarkably stupid, but he couldn't live with himself if he looked the other way. That wasn't who he was after all. Best get some sleep, he said to himself before closing his remaining eye. He would deal with the loss of his left eye later when he was fully healed. End flashback. Naruto and Fu were still in bed together, but Fu was sitting on the opposite end. The young teal-haired girl bent her head to the side when she heard his tale of how he got that eye patch. She had to say that she liked the idea of knowing a pirate. Naruto on the other hand just looked at Fu with confusion as the girl was focused on everything but him apparently. So tell me lucky boy, how did you end up here? She asked with a cute tilt of her head. Naruto suddenly snapped back to reality from his inner thoughts. I still don't know, all I know is that I am supposed to be in wave country right now. He pressed his right hand against his forehead. He still couldn't remember how he got here to save his life. Fu tilted her head some more, and honestly Naruto thought she resembled Akamaru a little bit. Wave country, that's a long ways off from here, like 400 miles long ways from here. How did I make the trip here then? He asked, 
completely stunned that he was literally 400 miles away from his last location. Could my body have really floated all the way over here? Fu jumped off the bed and placed her hand on her hips. Beats me, lucky boy, she said before walking towards the door, anyway go ahead and rest up some more. I'll be back soon, she said as she walked out the door and left Naruto to his own devices. He laid his head back on the pillow and pondered what was going on as his left hand went over his newly formed chest scar. This is too damn weird, he said as he fell back onto the pillow, his head resting comfortably around the stuffed cushion. He kept his lone eye onto the rooftop above as his mind began to trail off as he replayed what he remembered happened to him at Wave. Naruto remembered Sasuke was killed by Haku and that same feeling he had from the Hyuga incident returned stronger than before. He never felt anger and pure rage adrenaline rush as fierce as that one. He was blinded by bloodlust and would have killed the ice user had she not been so adept with her crystal ice mirrors. But he was able to find a strategy that allowed him to separate her from her technique. He nearly killed her but he stopped himself. Why did he put in so much effort to stop her from dying? And just how did he pull that off? Naruto looked at the hand that was supposed to punch a hole through her skull yet he did not know what made him stop. Perhaps it was because he thought that she was very beautiful, or was it because the both of them were very similar? Who knew, but it was enough to make him stop, especially when it came to her story. Flashback. Wave Country. Remaining still after hearing the girl before him tell the story of what she had gone through. While Naruto felt bad for her and even was willing to say that he understood the plight she was under, he still did not, could not forgive her for taking his best friend away from him. So what is it you wish to do? I am afraid that I can no longer be of any use for Zabuza-sama. Haku asked with blood dripping from the sides of her mouth. The ice user had nothing left to give in this fight as she felt her duty to protect Zabuza further slipping away from her grasp. This boy before her was something else, one moment he was this sweet innocent kid she found asleep in the forest and the next he was this ferocious beast ready for blood. She then watched as he pulled out a kunai knife with his exposed eye looking into hers but the girl only froze in surprise as she recognized it as clear as day. He has the Sharingan as well, she thought to herself. I understand everything you have been through, and in a million ways I wish that we were in different circumstances. But I cannot forgive you for killing Sasuke, he said before rushing towards her. Unknown to him, his lone Sharingan eye with two tomes spun wildly. As he ran, his eye followed Haku's movements perfectly to a T. But as soon as he was halfway there he heard the sound of chirping birds in the background. He then took note that once that sound went off, he could somehow see her forming a one-handed seal. He then focused chakra into his eye as he mentally called out, by Akugan. The veins in his left eye bulged and the silhouettes of everyone appeared in his vision along with Haku, as he saw her chakra network flare up. Then he focused his vision squarely on her with both eyes working in unison. The image then combined to show two versions of Haku, her real self and another that was a silhouette image encased in blue chakra. He then watched as that version brought her arm up to grab his kunai while bringing up her free hand up into a one-handed seal. His Byakugan then caught sight of his sensei standing with chakra surrounding his right hand. Zabuza was standing with what looked like eight dogs all holding him in place. His eyes then widened as he realized what she was about to do thus he changed course by skidding along the ground before forming a cross seal. A shadow clone quickly appeared and charged straight for Haku while the blonde boy focused his chakra towards his legs. Without a second thought he sprinted towards where his sensei was as Haku looked towards the sound of chirping birds in the distance. Her eyes then widened as she raised her right hand to block the kunai strike. I'm sorry Naruto-san but I cannot die just yet, she said as she formed a one-handed seal with her left arm and in a flash vanished in the air. Naruto on the other hand was already timing his move as with each step he took made him constantly adjust and readjust his angle until he finally felt comfortable with his next move. He had no idea how he did all that but it all ended with the results as well known. End flashback. How did I pull that off? He said to himself as he settled within his current predicament though his eye stayed focused on the rooftop for a few more minutes until his brain shut down. He was going to have to go over this some other time but for now he just wanted to sleep. But unknown to him, Fu stood with the door ajar watching over him with her kunai in hand. 
Her orange eyes fixated upon his form as beads of sweat lightly trickled down her brow. It wasn't that she didn't trust him, he seemed like a nice guy, sincere with his confusion. But something about him did not add up at least in terms of his story. He survived a 400 trip down a river with what appeared to be a giant hole in his chest, that wasn't normal by any standard, even among the shinobi she read about in the academy during history class. And then there was that burst of chakra. There were many things that she did not know about the world but there was one thing she did know. That she could tap into a similar potent level chakra as well and it was so strong that she felt inclined to investigate it. Could he be a Jinchuriki like me? She thought as she remembered finding his body radiating with red chakra. Nothing was adding up, not until she heard a buzzing noise but was not alarmed by it. It's hard to tell, but that chakra did indeed come from him. His body was radiating with power similar to mine. The buzzing demonic voice said with Fu not taking her eyes off Naruto. Of course she had every right to be suspicious, it came with the job after all. It was better safe than sorry, she would be wary until proven otherwise. The next day, Naruto woke up to the sounds of knocking against his door which caused him to sit up to stretch out his limbs. Another knock came causing him to rub the sleep from his right eye. Come in. I'm decent. The door was opened and Fu entered along with some stranger, but seeing Fu's body language it showed that she trusted him. He was an older man who looked to be in his late forties and had short smooth brown hair that was graying all on the outside with just the top of his head still having brown hair. He wore a black Takigakur forehead protector around his forehead and his hair hung over the left and right sides of it and he also had brown sideburns. He also had small black colored eyes and a small brown colored goatee. Attire-wise he wore a navy blue vest that had mesh wire underneath, white training tape on both his biceps, fingerless black gloves, a pair of black pants with a kanai holster on his right thigh, and black shinobi-styled sandals. His kind-looking face sort of put Naruto at ease as he sat on the chair in Fu's room next to his bedside. Hello young man, I am Heisen, the leader of this village and Fu's uncle. What brings you around these parts? Heisen asked in a soothing voice. Remembering the lessons Hiyashi drilled into his head, Naruto bowed his head from his resting position. Greetings Heizen san I am Naruto Uzumaki, Konoha shinobi extraordinaire, Dadbeo. He said with a thumbs up and smile. Doing such an action hurt his chest, perhaps he should take it easy until he healed completely. Greetings Naruto-san, I wish I could greet you much more fondly, but you are a foreign shinobi in my country and I have to treat you as an enemy until I am sure that you mean no harm. He said. I wish I could convince you that I am no enemy. I was in wave country and then. I'm now here after falling off a bridge. If it helps, I am a shinobi of Kanahagakur, and our villages are supposed to be allies. I won't betray or reveal any secrets so long as I am here. Naruto replied with a tired smile. It was honestly all he had to offer, if that wasn't enough then he honestly didn't know what he would do. Fu stared at him for a good minute until she perked up and looked at her uncle. I believe him uncle Heisen. Heisen gave her an odd look. Really? You honestly trust him? Nope, I don't trust him for a second but I think he has a cute butt. She said with a thumbs up and a very wide smile. Heisen could only look at his niece with a dumbfounded expression, it caused her to laugh. And Naruto could only feel odd that someone commented on his ass of all things. One week later. It took another week of healing and rest, but Naruto found himself out of the bed he was forced to lie in. Kayubi sure took his sweet time healing him, but apparently coming back from the dead could be taxing even on a gigantic nine-tailed entity. He was sure that the beast was still sealed within him, the seal on his stomach was still there and intact. For the whiskered blonde, he didn't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Ever since he learned about it, he wanted him gone but now that he was without his team or village he was glad he still had a connection to his village besides the Byakugan eye. Standing near the cabin Fu lived in, Naruto now wore a dark blue vest with mesh wire underneath, black pants and sandals. His leather eye patch was still covering his left eye and he was testing his reflexes by shadow boxing, his taped up arms making, whooshing, noises as he punched the air. Ah, I lost a step. Naruto grumbled to himself after the small exercise left him winded, perhaps he wasn't exactly up to snuff just yet. His lungs were burning from exertion, he
he would take it easy for now. But you look well trained lucky boy, Fu said with a wide smile on her face as she sauntered over to him. I expected that out of you, but you're still a prisoner here, you know. Does that mean I'm not allowed to train? I'm a shinobi and until I can move again I need to train. His eyebrow twitched from her nickname, apparently he was stuck with it. I would be a hypocrite if I told you not to train, after all I do it on a daily basis. Fu moved herself across from him and looked over his form. Uncle Heisen didn't say anything about not training, but I am going to overlook your training, and pummel you into the ground as my training partner. Oi, no one is going to use Naruto Uzumaki as a training dummy. Naruto barked with a tick mark forming on his forehead. Oh but that is what I'm going to do lucky boy. Fu smiled before getting into a fighting stance. I got to warn you though, don't underestimate me because I'm a wo. Fu barely had time to duck to the right when Naruto closed the distance between them in less than a few seconds and nearly popped her in the mouth. She then caught a palm strike that would have hit her solar plexus, raised her right knee to block a strike that would have hit her right in the groin. She then applied chakra to the bottom of her feet, deliberately using too much to blast away from the blonde until she landed ten feet away from him. Hey, what the hell are you doing? She yelled at him. If you were going to tell me not to take it easy on you because you're a girl, then you're sorely mistaken. I don't care if you're a boy or a girl, if we're going to fight then I'm going to hit you where it hurts. Naruto said before sliding into a stance that resembled the gentle fist yet was clearly different. His right hand was tucked into his side with his fist closed, legs spread apart to keep balance and his left arm half extended and the back of his palm facing her. Fu couldn't help but inwardly giggle as she got into her own fighting stance, her knuckles cracking as she formed her hands into fists. This is going to be so much fun. I agree, my little larva. A demonic buzzing voice in her head agreed. Naruto looked at his sparring partner with his lone blue eye. He wasn't happy about this situation, but he couldn't do anything about it for now. He was more or less a prisoner of Takigakur, but he wasn't going to let it get him down. So what if I'm their captive? I'll still get home. But until then I'll do whatever I can to not only earn their trust, but learn a thing or two. A quiet demonic voice in his head only scoffed out in annoyance. Naruto then transferred chakra into his left eye that caused the veins to appear. By Akugan, he whispered to himself. Within his vision showed the girl's chakra network that was highly erratic and powerful. Without waiting the blonde took off with his speed surprising Fu as he appeared in front of her executing a jumping sky kick. Leaf Hurricane, he shouted as she ducked under the kick while feeling the air flow of the kick but soon blocked a punch from his right fist that held far more strength than she was ready for and it caused her to skid along the ground lightly. Naruto then followed it up with a left palm to her right shoulder, the chakra infused strike causing Fu to fall into the ground back first. She grimaced on the ground as Naruto returned to his stance but had to take a noticeable pause to catch his breath. Already he was out of it and it was barely five seconds into the spar. This became evident when the mint-haired girl was back on her feet and delivering multiple strikes. To her shock though, Naruto was not completely out of it as he skillfully dodged and blocked her strikes but as he prepared a counter strike was shocked when his left palm was blocked and his feet were knocked over, causing the boy to land on his back now. But this time the girl followed up with ground strikes though Naruto blocked the strike pushed his body off the ground slightly with his free arm. This instantly threw Fu off balance and it made her take a step back. Naruto then with ease transitioned to his left hand and foot on the ground, then placing all his power into his right foot as it connected with the girl's chin. The force of the kick sent her high within the air, though she was shocked when Naruto appeared behind her. Bandages then found themselves wrapped around until it became a cocoon with just her head sticking out. Naruto then grabbed the bundle and spun before calling out, Primary Lotus. Slamming her into the ground with a cloud of smoke appearing while he jumped back and returned to his stance. You did good lucky boy but you lose. Fu said with Naruto suddenly surprised when her arms wrapped around his waist then she heaved him into the air while releasing her hold. Naruto managed to place the momentum to his feet as he made his legs counterbalance the toss, landing hard before jumping back in to engage with Fu. Both warriors held a back and forth trade of blows and exchanges yet neither side was willing to quit at least until Naruto's body gave out and he would collapse right on the battlefield. 
Fu grew instantly concerned as she rushed to his side and brought him back to her house. Time skip. One month later, wave country. A lot can change in a month as the impact of Team 7's efforts were still being felt throughout the land as the people of Wave began to embrace their newfound freedom. When the first week after the death of Gato passed and many hangovers from the countless hours spent celebrating, Tazuna finally returned to the bridge that had been severely damaged by Gato's bombs. Evidently the dead tyrant planted far more bombs than the ones that went off. He likely hoped that they would be his insurance policy if all the mercenaries were unable to subdue the shinobi. It took the entirety of Team 7 three days to completely inspect, disarm and safely remove every bomb Gato planted along with all of them still grieving the death of their teammate. Thankfully though they still took the next part of the mission seriously in making sure that Tazuna built that bridge. After the bombs were removed Tazuna would spend another week assessing the damage dealt by the explosives. Sad to say the damage was excessive. Holes littered the floor, tile was destroyed, ugly black blast marks, chunks of bridge missing. While not beyond repair, he would no doubt have to start over at a certain spot and salvage what he could. So with the help of the shinobi including Zabuza, as a, sorry for trying to kill you, favor, he was able to remove the partial damaged section. Unfortunately, that meant he would have to lose one third of the work already completed. Fortunately though he was not all that concerned with it as the entire town lent a hand to help out. Two solid weeks worth of hard work later on from all the men that risked everything on a harness while they installed pillars, from all the women that operated machinery they never used before and all the children eagerly helping where they could, Tazuna was able to see his dream become reality. The bridge was not only repaired but completed with all of his workers putting in around the clock shifts to see the project done. He would have loved to give them all the credit but it was the shinobi that he was the most thankful for. Kakashi assisted him in the leadership reigns by instructing workers to complete tasks while assisting the elderly man for the bigger headaches such as faulty wiring and extending the bridge. Zabuza took the grueling job of mapping out where the pillars would be placed on the bottom of the ocean. The waters were not an issue for Zabuza as his high affinity for water, he could hold his breath for a very long time which was apparently a regulation to become a shinobi of Karigakur. Thanks to that man's efforts alone, they were able to finish putting in the feet of the bridge that would secure the pillars. His daughter Tsunami made a humongous difference with the wives of that helped with keeping everyone present fed, while Sakura helped tend any wounds that the workers gained and Haku helped keep them hydrated. The young boy Sasuke though provided the pivotal use of his fire ninjutsu as he called it to help heat the beams they were trying to fuse into the bridge or properly place into a vital spot. The young man was mostly silent throughout his work but a few of the guys managed to break down his defenses enough to talk to him. The elderly male remained supportive of the young man knowing the loss he just endured not that long ago. The time went by fast and the work was endless but in the end, the bridge that would open wave country to more trading and shipping routes, courtesy of Gato, would no doubt bring in a new era of prosperity for his village and reign in different ways of revenue. Tazuna then wondered what to name the bridge until one night came when Team 7 walked him and his family back home. The blonde kid's absence was felt by all those that knew of him. His grandson told him that Naruto single-handedly defeated two mercenaries Gato sent to kidnap them. That young man brought his grandson's smile back and he could think of no better name. The Great Naruto Bridge, Tazuna said with the name etched onto the banner above the entry. I have to say I love the name, Sakura said after having time to reflect on how she treated Naruto while he was alive and came to greatly regret it. She really did miss hearing his loud voice over exaggerate things so that she could keep her cool. She was also taking into account that because she was not on either Naruto or Sasuke's level of talent. Naruto wound up dead and Sasuke was nearly killed. She needed to take her training more seriously. Naruto would still be here if she did. I think he would be jumping around like an idiot if he knew. Sasuke said with a smirk on his face that Sakura recognized as Naruto's. It made her smile fall slightly as he already changed drastically from Naruto's death. Haku only had a sad smile on her face as the image of Naruto dying in her place plagued her mind relentlessly. She kept hoping that this was all fake and that Naruto did not die for her yet she knew the truth. The lightning from Kakashi's technique left a permanent scar on her left arm, a marking that would forever haunt her. But she was ready to finally live for herself and learn to become her own person. 
She and Zabuza had a very long, mostly loud conversation on Zabuza's part, conversation on what their futures would be. Zabuza wanted to head west and maybe join the Snow Shinobi ranks since he heard their military numbers were low and the pay was very handsome. Haku argued that he can do that if he wishes but she wanted to go to Konoha and learn to be a shinobi. Zabuza spent a good 30 minutes going through a profanity-laden rant as to why he hated Konoha and how he was wanted for killing a dozen of their shinobi. Haku merely responded, A young man from there died for me. I have to honor that. And from there Zabuza spent a week in silence before he finally made up his mind. Speaking of Zabuza, he stood beside the masked Junin who could not take his eye away from the sign. I hate to admit it, but I like that runt. He said which broke Kakashi from his trance slightly as his right hand trembled a bit before placing it in his pocket. He was the number one unpredictable knuckleheaded shinobi I had ever seen. He reminded me a lot of an old friend of mine. He said though for a brief second Naruto's corpse appeared in front of him. He shut his lone eye for a moment and opened it back up to find everything back to normal. So what will you do? Haku informed me that she wanted to join our ranks. What will you do? I hate you tree huggers, but my days as the demon of the mist are clearly over. He said as he turned to Kakashi. Haku wanted me to stay here and atone for my misdeeds, but I do not think I could hide from it either or avoid my past coming here. Looking at the old man, Tazuna standing with his arm around his grandson's shoulders. I almost took this away from these people. I do not think I could face them. So I'm going to join your merry band of dipshits to keep myself and Haku safe. The Hokage will likely place you under probation but you will have a bed to sleep on for a while. Kakashi said with his usual eye smile. A bed huh? Been a while since I had a place to sleep regularly. Zabuza said as the rest of the kids gathered together. Though Kakashi soon found his vision turning dark and all he could see was Naruto's corpse on the bridge floor. His right hand shook unconsciously as he grabbed his wrist with his left hand. Naruto. Kakashi as he shook his head and his vision returned to normal. He needed to see somebody about this. You ready to finally have a place to call home? She asked Haku in a very delighted fashion that made the ice user smile somewhat. The two managed to create a friendship over the small window of time they were together and were able to find some common ground. Haku and her became sparring partners for the last two weeks with each resulting in the same. She got beaten into the ground time and time again. Sakura came to respect Haku's skill very well as the girl was above and beyond her level in many ways. It was clear why Naruto and Sasuke had such a hard time fighting her. But the girl was also a good teacher as little by little she was able to land a few more blows, dodge a few punches and make key counters. She was still far below Haku's level but she was at least improving bit by bit. I think I am ready to call Konoha my home, Haku said as she looked to where the village was located. In almost no time she would arrive at a new chapter in her life, a better chapter where she wouldn't need to run anymore. Looking to a hill overlooking the village Haku barely made out the modest grave marker that signified Naruto Uzumaki's resting place. Even if his body was lost to nature, he would at least have a place where people could pay their respects. She softly smiled and turned her head away towards the group that was beginning to depart. Until we meet again, Naruto Uzumaki. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.